Welcome, LARPcraftians, to another meeting we're going to be hosting here in September of 2014, end of the month, which means it is time for an elder meeting. We're going to be talking about subjects that are available to the player base, and we ask that everybody in the LARPcast today who's joining us, please mute your microphones if you don't have something to say, that way we don't pick up barking dogs and that sort of stuff when you're not talking. The LARPcraft site is uh, just went through a major update last night and it didn't erase the whole system. That's awesome. Um, all of the experience points and coin transferred over. If some of you recall who have been here a while, uh, the last time we had to do that, we had to go through thousands of profiles and manually enter in the new stuff into the new tracking system and holy cow did that take a long time there was like six that was a nightmare and a half uh yeah big time so uh really happy the it seems to be a little bit faster there's some new features on the site now where there's a little green tab that shows when you're online and um, you can kind of see players' points and coins and stuff. Not sure if we'll keep that on there, but that's a new feature. So um, if you go into the LARPers tab on the scrolls, you'll see who's in the lead with stuff. Not that it really matters, but that's just kind of how the tracking system works. We want to also put a big emphasis on the Colony vaults can now subtract coin. That was a major feature uh, that we really were getting developed in spring for the system. And now, if you go to your colony vaults, you'll see a coin subtraction button. So, after a game, if a player loses coin, or let's say they had 400 copper and they switched it into silver or something during a game and then they gave it you know as silver you can do that um, as the colony vault so you now have independent control completely of XP and coin to give and take as you as you see fit now we don't if you need to take away XP we're still going to have to do that through LARPcraft because that's usually the only reason you take away XP is for disciplinary reasons. So we as LARPcraft want to know about that and record it before that happens. Um, the chat seems to be working pretty well. The uh, LARP community will be up. The Risen will be up. The LARP market will be up. Um, trying to get that done this fall yet. And it's been a major undertaking, and it's expensive. But I personally invested in that stuff because we want to try to make the tracking systems as in character as possible. So when you're in, let's say, the scrolls, you feel like you're still kind of in the game. You're in a library, if you will, of what's happening. And to take out some of the non uh, the out of game stuff and put them in the new LARP community. Those will basically be in groups. So you can sign in with Facebook, Twitter, Google Plus. It's not a character name thing. You just, hey, we're, we love LARPcraft. There's a bunch of stuff. We want to know about LARP. That's where the community is going to be, excuse me, very important. That way we don't have a bunch of fictitious characters coming in just to check us out and then they never do anything. We want the character profiles to be meaty. And so giving people to just sign in with their regular names or come up with goofy names or whatever, you know, that'll be all free. And then, you know, crafting weapons and buy and sell and the marketplace, all that stuff will be in the LARP community. When you jump into the scrolls, that's going to be game specific stuff that will again, try to help. Like when you go to the scrolls, it's daunting. There's so many scrolls. 
And so we want to try to reduce some of that if we can move the audio game stuff into the community. Because it is going to be, and, and another reason we did that is because we have all these game systems we want to introduce, but the out of game stuff that's in the scrolls right now would apply to all those other game sets. So we, we don't, instead of making a section in each game set, let's just take those sections and move it into the LARP community for all game sets to see so we're not reinventing the wheel every time. That way the information stays in one spot. It'll be a lot cleaner. Let's see. Um, from the Elder section, you guys can see I'm starting to roll out the 2015 revisions based on uh, Elder votes, based on Chief votes, based on player feedback in the question sections. We're addressing all of those questions. And now you as elders in this fall term have a chance to review every chapter, make your comments, make sure you agree with everything and understand everything. Catch some typos if there is any, and you know if there's spacing issues, that kind of stuff. Um, that's this is the review time for the next few months before we release it in November, uh, December. We get it all ready for December, and then January first. Oh, new rule book. Okay, so that's pretty much all I had to say about that. Now let's get into some of the things we wanted to talk about with the, uh, Ufna and I had a conversation. I wanna know you guys' opinions. Groups can create their own vaults. Now they can't recharge them like a colony can, but they can accumulate XP and coin in those group vaults and then use them as they see fit to build their wealth to build their characters you know if people want to pool together to help speed up a character advancement um, it would work just like a faction or guild or any other real scenario would we wanted to just address to make sure like when you go to a game the fact that there was some confusion on my part because I didn't know how to do it, but there was some confusion as does the faction have to bring their character sheet and use it in game? Originally we were like, hey, that would be kind of cool. Then the chests and the money would all be in the game and it would be higher risk. But from a feasibility standpoint, if a guild or a faction has a ridiculous amount of coin or prop, stuff like that, <clears throat> it's not usually feasible for a colony, especially if they're just starting out, to have the props necessary to fulfill that. So, and realistically, would, let's say, a kingdom carry their treasure around with them everywhere they went? They wouldn't. So... Ufnar and I talked about it for about an hour yesterday. We just want to make sure that the players don't feel like the colony vaults, or no, I'm sorry, the faction vaults or the group vaults that can't be recharged, that have to, the, the stuff that goes into those vaults comes directly from the characters. That players don't see that as cheating, basically. I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page with, you know, that group vault is very, um, valuable, they pay for it because they get their own, it's almost like starting a colony where they get their own private areas, they get recognition, they get their own banner. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically as much work, it's actually a little bit more work than starting a colony. So, um, but it's proving to be a very valuable thing because people are able to, like I said, exchange XP, toss their coin into the colony vault, or I'm sorry, the faction vault or group vault, not colony. Colony is its own separate thing. That's an admin uh, vault. But the, you know, what do you guys think? Do you, do you think, you know, do you think we'll have any problems with people seeing faction vaults, guild vaults, tribe vaults, as anything negative? Did 
they're shaking their heads for those of you who can't see this in the Some audio the podcast. It's up to the members to recharge it, not the Lartcraft site itself to recharge it. Then I think they'll all understand that the value of a vault is the sum of its players. Yeah, that's very well put. Right. Uh, one of the things that our tenant had brought up during our conversation yesterday was, you know, and I can use my own character and my faction vault as an example. After an event, I dump all the XP and coin that I get awarded into my faction vault. Uh, and before going into an event, you know, I pull off what I feel is necessary for that event. Like knowing that the standard and Averin is copper pieces, even though I've got quite a bit of money stored up, you know, I may only pull out, say, like three silver and 15 copper. And that's more than enough generally to get me through an event. Uh, can I still earn coin in game? Yes. Well, can I still be looted? Yes, for that three silver and 15 copper. Uh, the rest of it would be protected. And that is one perk to having a faction. However, uh, and it's something I kind of want to put out to the other elder teams. We've talked about it a couple times in the past, and I know that I've implemented it. I know Eludia's implemented it. I think Midland even toyed with it for a while. <laughs> and that's having kind of a bank system in place uh, at a game. Now, everybody runs their games a little bit differently, and I, I realize that we use the the tavern, the, the main tavern, the main general store, whatever, as the central point for our village. Registration, I don't, I don't have an out-of-game registration booth. It's literally you come up in character to the tavern. You register as being in the village. You know, uh, you pay your, your taxes or whatever, your, your entry fee. And we, we write all that down. Then you make a withdrawal from our bank. Uh, and at any point in time throughout the game, because we always have somebody manning the tavern, you can come back up there and withdraw more money. Now, something we just tested uh, our last event, and it actually worked out really well, is if you wanted to protect the coin rather than you know risk getting looted, dying and getting looted in-game, you could actually deposit your coin into said bank but the bank charges uh a fee you know it was a minimum i think of of 10 copper to deposit and you know the bank took 10 percent right off the bat as a deposit fee uh and if there was an odd number we rounded up so it's always rounded up to the nearest copper so say you deposited a silver and a copper we would take you know two copper as a deposit fee. Uh, and our tenant had made a comment, well, doesn't that kind of make loot chests, you know, useless? And my response was no, because even though you had that option, sometimes paying that fee, you know, it's, it's not going to work, work in your favor to deposit it there. And in addition, you know, the tavern, while well, we'll keep it, We'll keep somebody nearby for like, uh, we keep water and that's another topic we'll talk about here in a bit. You know, we keep water and stuff on hand for players so that they, they can stay hydrated, but we open and close the tavern like a normal person would a shop, you know, it's only open from say nine to nine to five or whatever, which it's actually extend or hours are extended more than that. But I'm using that as an example. Uh, so you would have to do the business during those hours. Uh, after that, anything you still have on you at the end of the day would still have to go into your loot chest. And it's the same with, with factions. Uh, the, the example our tenant was talking, you know, he foresees, at least in, in Norhaven, a very massive faction in the works, you know, upwards of, of 50 members. And we, we talked about what kind of impact that would have on an economy because all of a sudden you've got 50 players that can continuously pay in their money into their faction vault. And in no time, you're going to have a faction that's probably got, you know, 10, 15 gold bars worth of coin. Uh, you know, and I, I kind of want to ask you guys, how do you feel that that would impact a game economy? Having 
knowing that there's an entity out there with that amount of coin compared to the average Joe who may only have, you know, say six silver or, at, you know, three or four gold, depending on how active you guys are. Well, first, Anybody? I want to, with the loot chest being useless, I if I said loot useless, I didn't mean useless. I just meant less valuable. It's a, people are still getting used to the loot chest. Uh, and um, I've had all my stuff looted from a sneaky little rogue. And, um, you know, it really added to the in-game, like, okay, my character was mad. I mean, we got... It was um, it was an amazing. I won't get into it, but it was amazing. Um, oh, yeah. Having a faction that would have that much wealth could literally buy the kingdom. They could they could make an army, uh, paying wages. Um, but how, as a game administrator, would you take that? How do you manage when? you know, possibly a good portion of your game entries are all one faction. Those are, those are very, you know, critical things to make sure everybody is still going to have fun at the event. If it's slated so heavy to one side, how would a promoter as a colony, how would you, how would you make it so that there's stuff happening that it's not just a game of this faction. You could put everyone who's not in the faction as NPC rogues that then steal everything and balance the game out again. Make some enemy NPCs out of everybody else and see if we see if they can hold off. It's a good idea. We could ask that the faction leaders be part of the plot in that they try to spread out their group so that they're not all clumping or, you know, most people will realize if they have a group that big that it's going to affect the game outcome. And, you know, it could turn disastrous or it could be really good if you're in communication with those leaders of that group. And to say, hey, we have some specific quests or we have some things or, you know, try to get them involved a little bit more. It's, again, to try to make sure that, we, you know, when a questing group goes out, and you, if you had 30, guy, 30 guys and gals as their characters go out to fight this one big bad NPC, well, that NPC is going to come back. Uh, okay. You know, they're, they're going to see that group, and they're going to have to, uh, as an adaptable NPC, they're going to have to increase their hit points uh, quite a bit. Quickly tie some, you know, spell block on them and that kind of stuff. I mean, it'll be tough. One on thirty, they're going to get beat no matter what. There's really, even if they're all low level characters, but um, these are some very interesting factors that will, you know. You know, as we try to build good games, these are things that we're trying to to address as we grow in the in the game system. So, what what do you what do you what are some other ideas on how to handle um, what? What I've actually done out of game is I've approached the players uh, when they started talking about setting up this faction, and when I realized in my case that you know seventy percent of my colony was all going to be a part of this faction the guy that was starting it and the players, I actually asked them if they could put a cap on how large they'll let their faction get for the time being so that it's not, you know, all one-sided every game. And at least in my situation, you know, they were all very reasonable about it and they understood why because of these kind of implications where you run a game, you know, 70, 80% of the people on the field all belong to one faction. So that leaves pretty much everybody else either fending for themselves or, you know, they're going to get owned. Uh, so I, I would say as, as a promoter, you know, you probably want to approach those groups of players and, and explain to them 
what kind of impact that they're really going to have on the game if they come in such force. Now, if it's a big game, like say the world event, you know, where we've got 100, 200 players and you have a faction that accounts for, you know, a quarter of them, you know, 50 players, that's still going to be an impact, but it's not going to be as dramatic. And I think it'll open up quite a bit of role play because all of a sudden you've got this really large force you could see other factions banding together, you know, maybe even absorbing one another in order to try and counterbalance this. Um, and I'm getting off on a tangent here. My, my original point is really, you, you should probably approach your character or your players about trying to limit what they do as a faction. Like our tenant said, you know, don't travel in groups of 30. Uh, I, I've always used the adaptable NPC method with my guys. I, I tell them right off the bat, this is what you're going to play if you're playing a, a cannon fodder monster, monster out in the realm. You know, this is the power level I'd like you to be at, but if they come at you in force, I mean, big force, by all means, you know, our, our policy is kill or wound at least 50% and then take the, take the dive. Don't even worry about tracking hit points at that point. Make it interesting. Kill or wound about 50% and then take the dive. Yeah, that's a good good way to do it. Um, Berner over in Sweden over there, he's probably got more LARPing experience than all of us. Uh, being, And he's got the – in the European games, some of them are thousands of people. And – what have you seen over there? How do they handle big factions like that? Do, do you know? Uh, it's, a bit, it's a bit different. I mean, in, in Germany, where you have like 4,000, 5,000 players, uh, they usually have like five or six big factions, and then a large army of NPCs. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, and, and the NPC faction just gather up and attack one faction. Re retreat, attack another faction, and they just uh, do that for hours and then and just fight. Um, over more locally, uh, we have a big faction that goes to the events here, and they sometimes be like 50% of the population of that game. Uh, what, what I become now is that our, our smaller faction are now banding together, so next time. Uh, this uh, spring, you all attack them. Okay. So they're walking around and being bully boys and uh, pushing people around and being obnoxious. So, you know, here we don't take that. We have to uh, band together and we attack them. And of course, off game, you're all friends anyway. So we have, we have talked about it already, and it's just they are like these pushy, bully barbarians and that attracts uh, certain uh, types of people. But uh, the leaders there are uh, good with it. Just communication, 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 really. And uh, the huge is not a problem. I mean, if it becomes a problem, have a sit down. This is still a problem that maybe they should run their own games. And they can sit around the camp and play with each other. Okay, yeah. That, having the communication between the groups. Sorry, folks. Uh, uh, his audio was very choppy. I apologize for that, but you still could understand it. So, um, you know, that's how some of the big groups are doing it. They're, they're, they're playing against the big faction or the communication is, the, you know, is the key. Having all the players understand before any problem comes, comes about. And we do turn, <laughs> we do turn into, uh, you know, everybody is, you know, very friendly and, and, you know, as long as everybody's on the, on the same page, usually it doesn't become a problem. So thank you for the, for the input from the European masters over, over there as we, on the other sides of the world, try to, oh, oh. <laughs> you know, realize who's doing it right, who's been doing it the longest, and learn from them. They got a lot of answers. They had to learn the hard way. So working together and make games better. Um, I kind of muted a few of these. If you come into a cast, if you click on your name, 
Carlos and Uf, well, Ufnar, it's hard because he's on the cell phone. He can mute himself through his phone. But if you're in a cast, hit the mute button on your thing. Um, that way, if a dog barks or something happens, it doesn't come into the cast until you're ready to talk. So, okay, I think we covered how to handle large groups and factions and the faction vaults. I think we're pretty comfortable with that. We'll try to get that out to the viewers. You guys as elders, please try to tell your players how that works, how the, fac how the group vaults work. You know, stress, that's a great way to build character relations and groups. Some people try to do it through the scrolls, and that was never the intention to try to uh, market the group through the scrolls. It's more or less, you have to be at a game. You know, you have to encounter each other. I mean, you could probably do it Flight of the Bird, Foxing the Scroll, Mystery through the scrolls you could do it that way but i think most people prefer to meet up as a group at a game and as we travel between colonies it, it can develop that way my concern with the scrolls and being recruited through the scrolls is on the scrolls i'm quite friendly welcoming warm trying to encourage people to play but in character i'm a racist aloof annoying person that most people try and hunt down and kill um so my issue is that if you recruit me through the scrolls you're recruiting the wrong person which is why i agree with our tenant how it should be done in person at games so those are things we want to mention to the you know we want to mention those things to the players and say hey you know don't use the scrolls, really, when you're grouping up, do it at a game. Or, you, you know, like if I know that Ufnar has a Bangarain faction in St. Louis, I might drive the six or seven hours to make that story complete or to try to interact with them. I mean, the stories are becoming so powerful now that it's a good way to connect all of the colonies together in a certain region or between two regions. Heck, worldwide, if I can convince my wife to go to Australia or Sweden. Um, I think I got her sold on Puerto Rico. Island, that's easy. But I would definitely love to go to Europe, especially attending a game, even if I could just watch. I might pee myself in excitement because that is just awesome. I love how they do it over there. I just love it. Yeah, one of us has to win win some lottery, so we can all kind of just have a big expense account. And be like, here, let's all go to each other's games. This will be great. <laughs> or get sponsored by Red Bull or Pepsi or something. I don't know. That Pepsi. would be awesome. That would be awesome. And as you grow into a lot of numbers, it's you know our our media channels are growing every day. And as you guys start making videos, and we start sharing channels and stuff i'm just waiting you know to get quality content on your guys's youtube channels i can list you under the larkcraft channel as a preferred channel and then they'll you know go to each other's stuff and if we got a specific topic and you guys have a video that's on a specific topic you know we can be like hey check this video out and annotate or um you know put the the little picture message thing on our YouTube video, they click over and go to your, to your video. Or we can edit it for you and put it wherever you want. I mean, whatever. I mean, we're just trying to grow the community and video is one of the strong points of Warcraft. So Carlos, he's, you know, he can do a lot of video editing. He's really good with media, logos and that kind of stuff. He does it like he gets paid to do it. Um, so, I mean, there's, and there's a few others that do that as well in, in our community. So you can use them if, if you can, if they're available, at least to give ideas on how to do stuff. So, um, moving on to another subject, hydration at a game. We've recently had a few games where we had, what is that? Oh, hydration. Gotcha. The orc was showing me a water bottle. And he's drinking. The couple of games, Ufna and I, you know, we had a game 
two weeks ago, and we both experienced a massive intake of water, even though the temperatures weren't crazy. And some of us had water that was uh, almost gone. Players brought water, promoters brought water, and we almost we almost didn't have enough. So where we played at the Woodlands of Esker, there is water available so I can go back and re replenish. Where Ufnar is, he has to go off site to get water or how does that work? Is that accurate? Yeah, uh, it, either we either we pack it in or, you know, we have to, somebody's got to make a water run. I mean, there's a Walmart less than 20 minutes from the site. But where we're at, I mean, when I said it was an undeveloped forest, there's no running water. There's no amenities whatsoever. We've, we've had to completely build our own. But there's a stream. There's a stream, but it's, it's a good half hour hike to it and half hour back uphill. That would be a good quest. So bring back water from the stream. Good. It would be a good quest, and we're actually, I was thinking about having something to do with it uh, at our upcoming event, but we all decided that it just, it wasn't worth it as a viable water supply, so we brought it all in, and like he was saying, you know, I, I only had 14 people in attendance at my last event. The colony brought 18 gallons of water. Each of my players brought at least three gallons of water a piece. And when we left the event, we carried out less than a gallon and a half of water. That's and, getting dangerously I mean, low. Yeah. I mean, the temperatures did break almost 90 one day. But the other two days, you know, it was, it was low to mid-70s. So it it's not it wasn't excruciatingly hot, but you know that's that's something. The main reason I made that post is this is more as a promoter standpoint than individual player safety. I mean we've we've already stressed the importance of, for our players to make sure that they're staying hydrated. We've told our elders you know you need to make sure that you're watching your players, looking for signs of dehydration and of heat stroke. But a good way for you to counteract that is to keep a supply of water on hand, either at a tavern or I don't care if it's your own personal tent. That's just, it's free. Don't worry about charging it. Just keep water in your guys. It is so important that you make sure everybody stays hydrated. And also promote to bring water and Gatorade and that kind of stuff. You know, bring a lot of it. Bring some into the game. Keep some in your car as a backup. So that players also have the responsibility, you know, not that the, you know, if the promoter has to bring water all the time, well, you're going to need a truck and an IBC tote of water eventually, you know, where it's, what is an IBC tote, like 500 gallons or 350 gallons, 200 gallons? I don't know. Something like I that. that yeah. time, I'm like, I'm seriously thinking about one of these, but it's, um, it's definitely an issue. And if you don't have the correct amount of water, we had a game last year where we had a player almost go into uh, – he almost fainted uh, because he, you know, he was in the action. He didn't think about stuff, and all of a sudden he got dizzy and he fell over, and um, you know, he just didn't drink enough water. And when it players are excited – go ahead. Sorry. It might also pay to put up the symptoms of dehydration so people can recognize it. Um, I do first aid and sports training with uh, national netballers. Um, and we've had to deal with a few dehydration issues because of change of climate between South and North Australia. Um, but half the team players didn't even know the symptoms of dehydration. So it might pay to put a, a first aiders scroll up and, and put up things to look out for. Yeah, definitely want to do that. Um... You could also have a sheet available at registration or something to have it at games. I know one of the two, those are two of the main things that we try to have at games is the dehydration, safety, first aid stuff posted. And then also what dangers do this realm bring? What, you know, insects, shrubbery, 
what are, what are some things that can hurt the players here? And just having it posted so that people know, you know, that it's just kind of, it's common sense to a lot of us, but if, a, if they're traveling in from another area, you know, they, they may not know what flaming nettle is or poison ivy or poison oak or, you know, poisonous snakes or, you know, spiders or, you know, I mean, there's, there's just a ton of stuff. And when we're bushwhacking in the, um, in the forests and stuff, those are very legitimate concerns. In fact, at the last Esker event, we found at Tall Oak, there is a huge beehive. And I don't know if it was yellow jackets or, but I mean, that sucker was just massive, but it was hanging way up in the trees. So, you know, we just made people aware of it. There were no bee problems, but just said, you know, we tried to make people aware of it as much as we could. Like at Midland in the prairie, there's these huge anthills all over the prairie, like that tall everywhere that if you tromp through them, they're going to start biting you. So those are definitely things to mention in that player meeting and having it posted. Good. Good, good. How do you train your elders? I mean, basically, could you do some scenario training? You know, let's have Carlos, you know, he's in Puerto Rico. It's a freaking ridiculously hot there all the time. He's tropical. I mean, they're used to it, but what if somebody from the north or extreme south comes into Puerto Rico where it's near the equator and they're not used to the heat or the humidity, plus they put on all their garb and their costumes? You know, they could, they could, faint in five minutes you know if they're not ready for it i honestly recommend that they change their um garb um get something more uh, weather uh something more for the for the type of weather that we have back in the island because um i mean sometimes i manage to get all all day with my armor and when i take it off it's I need to go to bed, you know, I need to rest. So it's really devastating for me because it's always all year 90 degrees, a hundreds. Um, we don't have seasons. Uh, it's always summer in the island. So if, if we did an event that a lot of people that are not from the island are coming to visit, I, I recommend that people bring lighter garb Main, uh, really good um, armor for this kind of weather is chainmail because um, chainmail can breathe through your your garb, so it would be better. Um, for it also acts as a heat sink. The chain will actually cool you off because it's it's a it's a metal heat sink. That's right. Um, I I own one, and I that was the first piece of um, armor that I used in, in the island. And for me, it's one of the best that I have gotten my hands on because, for example, leather armor does a really good job, but it suffocates in a while. It really does suffocate. So that's, those are good things to mention and try to get players to, to realize. Thanks, Carlos. No problem. Um, let's see, what else do we have on the agenda here? Okay, pros and cons of colonies supplying food for their players at a game. There's mixed emotions about this for a colony to supply players with food. Uh, we've progressed from a few players to a lot of players to a few players and back and forth. And once the, what we found is players start bringing their own food and to put them to, to, to feed a colony can break a colony uh, if you overspend, which we've, I've, I'm notorious for that. I don't know who's going to be there. You know, I plan for 10 people and I end up with 40 people and then we're just scrounging. And, uh, you know, trying to provide food for everyone is really tough. And when you start getting into big meals, I mean, it can be 90% of your budget is food which increases game entries, which increases time, it takes more material. So when players, and again, this, 
evolves with time as people start coming to games, as they build their garb, as they build their props, they bring tents or easy ups or that kind of thing. A lot of them will also bring food. People like specific types of food. And as a colony, what we try to do, and I know others are doing this too, is we back down on the main meals and we provide more of the snacks, fruits, vegetables, uh, stuff that you could probably gather at that location if you were really in that environment. Um, and then let them make the main meals or you know, some of the people, we actually have chefs coming in who play, they love to play, and to try to create a meal that a, you know, that a chef could do would be, yeah, I mean, you could take orders, you could do catering, you could bring food in if you want it. Um, but some of these players that, you know, they're five-star chefs. I mean, they make, I mean, they're, <laughs> you, you couldn't make what they could make because that's their main profession in real life. And they know all about food and that's what they do. So utilize those types of people and they're in the scrolls. You can see them. We actually have a whole food and drink recipe area for the medieval stuff right in the scrolls. And you can utilize those, those recipes and the people who are really good at that stuff and try to balance it wow. out. I, I, scroll. Yes, it is. I really like the idea of, um, of people, for example, um, I really like to, to try international people. I mean, um, food. Um, if I go over to Australia, I would like to get some Australian authentic food. So, so can, so, so I, I know what it tastes like to taste something new. If people are coming to my island, for example, people from the United States, Sweden, or Australia, I would love to make, um, authentic Puerto Rican food for them so they can have that unique experience. <laughs> yeah, very. It, we're all laughing because we're talking about the typical stereotypes of shrimp on the barbie and kangaroos and grubs and drowsy. I wouldn't mind saying kangaroo at all. <laughs> He's going to set it straight, I'm sure. And ants, yeah, yeah. But you're right, each um, one has that. I know that we tried as a colony to, you know, cook big meals for everybody and ultimately what it ended up doing Frey, one of my elders is a chef in real life you know and the poor guy i swear was going to have an anxiety attack because the fire wasn't getting hot enough or the stew was just taking too long to really break down and you know it, it added so much stress on him just trying to cook the food i mean we had everything we needed for it but, you know, th between that and the cost of the food, we eventually decided that as a colony, we would not provide sustenance. You know, we would not provide meals. Uh, what has happened and happened this last game is we had players come in and everybody kind of threw various foods together. We ended up making some homemade chicken noodle soup. You know, but that was literally all the players were involved in, in making that and supplying it. So there was no heavy cost on any one individual. Um, I know at my coming, at the event coming up, you were talking about, you know, having players that are actual chefs. We've got somebody coming up out of Tyrandale. She loves to cook. She is uh, also a cook in real life, but is a non-com. She wants nothing to do with the combat in the system. So what she actually is do, going to do is she's going to set up her own tavern, whatever, in our game, and she's going to do nothing but cook all weekend, you know, and, and, and sell it to people uh, for game coin, uh, which is a really interesting dynamic, you know, to be able to walk into a village and say, go to a baker and buy some breads or some sweet rolls or something, or go to you know, say a butcher shop and get some, some meat. Granted, we would do either pre-cooked or whatever. Uh, you know, it helps add that, that extra layer of immersion. 
but what we've done is like our tenant said, we, we provide snacks. We, uh, the colony will pay that cost up front. I don't tack that onto the entry fee and we just sell it for game coin and a little bit of muggle money on the spot. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. And then you're, you know, what you may have, I mean, we've spent three, $400 on food. We spent $50 on food. We've spent $25 on food and it really, doing like a pre-registration, whether you do it with uh, with a fee or not. We've tried it with Google Forms. We've tried it, I mean, we've done it through the merchant accounts. We've done it through PayPal. All of it works and doing a pre-registration really helps you plan for those types of meals. The next like evolution, like now we have people coming in from the SCA and other game systems that have, they've been doing it for 20 years or 10 years and they have all the props, they have all the stuff and they enjoy doing it. If somebody's going to host a feast with some of these professional chefs and that sort of thing, um, you know, we can make a separate game uh, fee for if you want to be part of the feast of yada yada here at such and such, there's, you know, it's $10 or $20, whatever the chef wants, you know, and then basically just pass the, the cost for the meal to them. They're experts at it anyway. Why would you try to not do that? You know, and then you got an awesome meal that's well prepared because that's they're they're in charge of that you know i know in some of the european games i've seen it like conquest and some of the others i mean they have like burger king and that kind of stuff i mean they have thousands and thousands of burgers come on trucks i'm not kidding i mean it's it's like a major catering deal i saw that and i was blown away like oh let's bring the semi of food you know it's like oh, oh. That's, but I mean, when you got 7,000 people, that's what you got to do. So, and those aren't, those aren't held every month. So, I mean, that's a, that's a, you know, different kind of situation. So good, just a, good, good, good uh, topics on food and, you know, see what your colony wants to do, play around with some different ideas and see what the players want to do. A lot of times the players, if you give them enough time, players will also comment like, hey, do we want to have food or not? Here's some fruits, here's some vegetables, here's some nuts, here's some of that kind of stuff, and go from there. Should work. Sorry, my dogs are barking. Here, my mutual microphone, and here's my dog barking. Great. Um, but should we move on to the next subject? I know some of you have... You know, we got a worldwide audience here, and some of you are, you know, it's four in the afternoon. Some of you, it's like two in the morning. It's, you know, 9 a.m. here or 10 a.m. here. So um, we're all foreigners. We're all foreigners. <laughs> um, um, what I do for food is basically we bring our own snacks on my colony. We've played for like three or four hours. And what basically we do is we go have dinner afterwards in a, in a nearby uh, restaurant or fast food store. That's, that's, that's what we do normally. At, at uh, Midland, during our, after our practices every week, we go to Subway. And yes, we, we, we actually go on Garb to get some food, and it's really yep, awesome. That's what we do. We actually now got uh, some of our giveaway stuff is from Subway because we go every week uh, or every week to them. So they brought in a sponsor because they go on Garb every week after practice to that location and patronize their, their business. That business, in turn, gives them gift certificates for items to give away at games. That's a really good strategy to build a uh, local presence with the community as, as a LARP group, as a club. It's a really good club. idea. Yep. Okay, Greycore had a few additional points he wanted to bring up. Yep, there they are. Ching. Um, there was uh, talk about Sometimes at games we have people, elders, and players that are coming out of character when there's a downtime. 
Uh, Great Court just wanted to stress, try to keep your players in character and remind them if they start going out of character to either take the conversation out of the game or don't go out of character because it really will distract the entire game and it can have a snowball effect of once a few people start going and talking about real life stuff, a few more start doing it and it just degrades the game. So mention it before a game, mention it in the event listings, mention it in the scrolls, you know, stay in character, stay in character, stay in character, try to practice. It's not easy for a new person. It's not easy in some game situations, but to try to stay in that character for the, the, the duration of the game. And again, if you have to have a conversation, we understand, just take it out of the game, you know, go to the parking lot or whatever. Um, I really identify with this problem because um, when I started LARPing, I mean, when I started my, the, my LARP craft group in Puerto Rico, it, LARP was not uh, a thing, you know, it was not recognized uh, ever on the island. So, for example, for the first uh, games we were playing, and for example, a friend approaches to me and asks, hey, how, man, how are you, man? How is the family in the middle of the game? How's your family doing? And like, dude, you know, we're on uh, role play. You have to keep it up, you know? Oh, okay, no problem. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> and he quickly, jumped, he quickly jumped back to, to, to the role play, you know? But it's something that has to be practiced. And like Ryan says, if you really need to say something, uh, the best way to do it is approach to, to the person that you want to talk to the ear and say, hey, I need to t tell you something. Let's go um, to the out of the game area to speak a little, uh, for a moment. That's basically the, in my opinion, the best way to deal with that situation. Rog, Rog says, or cast, cast curse of pain and walk away. Stop talking! Ah! You can do it as a character in game. That'd be cool. They will less. They'll. They won't forget it as easily if you banish them in game as a character for doing something that you wouldn't want to do. Take out the fake whip as the rogues or the. Uh, Naturally, you know, I could see something like the orcs or the, you know, something of a major tribe like. Ten lashings. You know, like take them to the stocks or something. <laughs> what do you do? Uh, you went out of character. <laughs> Holy crap. Is that real blood? No. Maybe. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. So just keep reminding the players, and you got to keep practicing. Players aren't going to remember it. If, you know, and try to make a stress even at a practice or a battleground. Be like, okay, we're going to try an in-game session now. We're going to try to stay in character as we do some of these things. You know, help them by giving them some practice in those situations and keep mentioning communication like you know burner said especially as you get larger communication is key you got to keep reminding them and got you got to keep repeating yourself have you ever noticed in the large craft videos a lot of the video stuff is repetitive a lot of things we say is repetitive because i mean that's how people learn so try not to be a, a you know annoying about it but um you know I'm around. So even as uh, NPCs, too, are notorious for it sometimes, especially at a downtime, they take their masks off. And, I mean, we understand if there's nobody around, but they could be they could be being stalked. I mean, PC players, some of these rangers and some of these folks that are really good at ambushing, holy crap. I mean, seriously, I, I've been ambushed. And I, I totally, for real, didn't even know they were there. I mean, they got some massive real-life skill in sneaking around and not making any noise and it's it's cool i mean to get scared out of your armor just about because you, you i mean wow it, it's i mean you for, you don't forget those things and that's really neat right uh another thing i've, I've i don't know if i'm muted or not no you're good. Can you hear me? you're good okay uh crap <laughs> yeah what i found that the breakdown in character, I mean, you, you've got your newer players that just aren't accompanied to it, and that's just, that's a practice thing. But the the biggest instances where I've seen 
the the breakdown and being in character is during big lulls in the game. Uh, so that's something that you might want to take into consideration too. If if you can keep the game rolling at all times, people are less apt to break character. It's going to happen. Humans want to talk to other humans. It's it's going to happen. Uh, but you can minimize it, like I said, by by making sure there's plenty going on in the event to to keep people busy. Um, yeah, my my brain just went dead. No, it's okay. We we were entertained by Rog's like S and M whip that he has over there. I don't know what the heck that was. That that's your uh, witch doctor thing, isn't it? That's your totem or something? Yeah. From this light, it looks like a sex toy of some sort. So, but when you hold it up, and then you can see the tribal stuff on it, then it's less. Kind of wish I could see that. Uh, You'll have to watch this later. But an another thing is, if if it comes down to it. Uh, I know at our last event, man, the heat in the middle of the day just absolutely killed everybody. I mean, our our hilltop village is in a wide open clearing in a field. It's not under tree cover, so you know we were we were really feeling it. And for about two three hours there, you know the the game pretty much broke down. I nobody actually called, you know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna pause the game for a little bit or anything. But it just, it kind of happened. People migrated under canopies and, you know, they set up like chess boards or dice or whatever and started entertaining themselves. And as is human nature, you know, as they're playing a game, they started breaking character. And I could have, any of my elders could have really pushed the issue, but seeing as how we didn't have anything going on because it was that hot, you know, we let it go. Uh, and somebody had actually, after my event, Every event I have, before we dismiss everybody, before we actually even allow people to sign out, we do a uh, an interview with the players to get feedback on that particular event, what they liked, what they didn't like, uh, what they'd like to see in the future. Uh, and one of the things that was brought up was, you know, if, if it comes down to that, as as the game admins, you know, for us to actually make an announcement that, hey, you know, we're going to pause the game for a little bit and then, you know, reinitiate it later. Uh, and the elder team, we, we sat and talked about it. And I, I really like your guys' feedback on this particular. Uh, do you think it would be better to actually call it and say, all right, we're going to pause the game. We're going to resume, you know, say three o'clock once it's cooled down some, uh, which I know it won't, but you get my point. Uh, or is it better to just kind of let that that lull take hold and just let it start back up again naturally, either by a random NPC coming in and kicking things off again or something like that? Uh, our justification was that I didn't want to make an official stop, start stop call because even during those lulls, you still had periods where somebody would start doing something in character and communicating with somebody in character. Uh, some people like myself, you know, I, I didn't break character, even, even talking to somebody who's talking to me about something out of character. I stayed in character and just played oblivious to the real world. Uh, kind of the same thing that we did last year at Esker at the world event. Uh, a lot of the orcs did that to, to try and encourage people to stay in character, uh, especially amongst ourselves, because that was good times, good times. Uh, so yeah, uh, what kind of what kind of feedback can I get from you guys on that? We've got our first outpost event coming up in November, which is exciting and nerve wracking. Um, but I've actually scheduled scheduled in a, a lunch break for about an hour, where everyone will stop any field work come in and have some lunch, some water, so they can rehydrate, get some more sustenance back into them before they get out there. Um, that way I can sort of, because uh, one of our colony members is a nurse, uh, so her and I can look at the, the players, talk to them in character, but also make an assessment of their um, uh, health, if you will, before we let them go back out into the field again. Um, but we could also get some feedback on how the day is going as well. Um, so I'm a strong believer in scheduled breaks, but then, as I said earlier, I've dealt with people dehydration. It's not fun. It's not pretty for anyone that's involved. 
I think that something as simple as even a bard or a storyteller can help keep things in game during those times. To try to focus some of your gameplay around a sit-down activity. Maybe like Serena wanted to bring out this gambling game that's very um, lucrative <laughs> uh, by using in-game props, quest items. I mean, it's, it's like gambling with stuff that you have in-game. And to host that during that peak sun time or whatever. Um, and also finding, you know, like having a, the village, if you're looking for a location or considering where to put the main village, having it under a tree canopy is a really beneficial thing in the summertime. I know we have a few realms that are all, the, the entire acreage, like woodlands of Esker is almost entirely tree canopy. It brings its own dangers with all the trees but it also in a dead of heat moment boom you got that covered deep light it's underground at 68 degrees all the time or 70 degrees you know elm home i mean that's almost all forested a lot of your colonies have forested areas but so i mean those are some of the things out of game that you can look at it depends on your options you know really what what can you do but having something going on that's not physical during that time or to have something in your back pocket in the event a lull happens unexpectedly, like, oh, we're going to pull that out. Let's, you know, there's nothing happening. Let's make something happen that's more story driven, that's more, that's, le you know, less, you know, more role play intense, but not, not battling. Now where you're hiking through three miles of woods to find something at that point. Or woods isn't as bad. Like, let's say you got a desert area or a prairie area where you're in the heat. But yeah, Dra uh, Drazul, that's a great way to say it. take a lunch break and secretly you're actually looking at players' statuses as a player. That's a really good way to hide a risk management um, situation. It also gives us a chance to reset the field, put out more crafting materials, that sort of thing as well, right. without the plan catching us. Burner, does it ever get hot in Sweden? Does it stop snowing and stuff? And if I'm hot, <laughs> for us, this summer was extremely hot. I mean, it was so hot that I had to use flip flops. Wow. <laughs> no, of course, and yeah, we have like two weeks in the summer that can be real hot, and that can be actually a problem because we are not used to heat over here. And if we go south, I mean, I was in Spain in May, and I got a heat stroke, and I'm used to, I'm used to that. I'm used, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm used, I've been mean, uh, a lot in Southeast Asia, I'm used to, to hydrate myself, I'm good at that. I mean, I mean, I, I'm immersed myself, and still, I was more concerned about my other players than myself. So I went down. <laughs> that was a quite an experience. Uh, but of course, I mean, that was like high altitude, uh, high, not high temperature that I'm used to, full armor. You know, this was for the Battle of Nation competition. So it's like, yeah. So the heat can be a problem for us, especially when we go abroad. Uh, when we have games in Sweden, it can be a problem, but usually not. We have the opposite though, that we have the uh, cold frostbite hyperthermia, uh, that season is coming up now, that we have to look for, especially if you walk around the period shoes. They are not good is uh, isolation in them, so you can get real real frost bites on your, on your toes at least. So, I think each region has their own assets or what they have to uh, look for. I mean, in some area you have the poison oaks, we don't have them here. We have uh, other stuff instead. But so I think it's good, especially if you get people from outside your colony. I mean, you can take for granted that, that you have a game in this council and people come up from Florida that maybe understand because they're in America. Yeah, but they still have different 
has uh, some uh, different areas have uh, different uh, things that have to uh, put in considerations. Right. Okay. Yeah. As the seasons change and as seasons become more violent, um, we're seeing weather switching and changing as climate change goes, you know, through its cycles. And as game promoters, we got to prepare for that and make sure that people understand when you have garb on. That's a perfect example too. As we start switching into seasons, um, that you know whether we're coming into winter or coming into summer you know, depending on what hemisphere you're in, the, you know, what type of garb needs to change and blogging about it, talking to your players about it. I mean, get them to understand that, you know, this garb that you have, whether it can play for Risen or anything else, doesn't matter, you know, layering up, bringing options, you know, what if it downpours? Do you have an extra set of something to change into? If, if you're in the middle of something, you're just soaking wet. The footwear is definitely a concern in the northern and the snow belt where you get a lot of uh, folks that will go out there and they're like, oh, we'll be fine. And they hike out in the woods in the snow for, you know, an hour and they can't feel their feet. And it's a major concern that they don't have frostbite or worse. Some of the <clears> – <throat> we've, we've addressed some of it with, like, putting additional layers of leather, uh, covering their boots. Having because like like um, Bernie said, p uh, costume shoes they suck in the winter. Uh, you know they're so light; they're made for traveling around in, in heat. Did you have something, Ufner? No. Okay. The <clears throat> so. We do have a few videos that we started doing in winter of how to dress appropriately for winter. Share those videos. We did, Half of our videos are done in snow. Uh, and we try to make sure that we do videos in all the seasons because we do LARP in all the seasons. We need some more tropical videos, though, and we need some, some you know, we need some of that kind of stuff. We need some, uh, some of the... Um, European countryside videos and uh, the Australian outback videos. Hint, 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 hint. You got cameras on your phones. Take the video. I can help you edit it. Just send it to me. <clears throat> but, um, you know, really, LARP is all seasons. <clears throat> and as our group got bigger in Norhaven, a lot of the people that have a lot of garb, they're like, why don't you ever host winter games? And we used to host winter games, and we got six people. And you, you blow through about 40 gallons of propane, and you got the torpedo heaters, and the amount of wood you burn is significant, and the structures you need to burn inside a structure are much different and costly, or you're huddled up in the trailer trying to warm up. So we didn't really have the right gear. The players didn't have the right gear to, to do that. But if you do have some of the right gear and you can start building the right gear, now as you come into fall or spring, you can prep your gear, do training sessions, do uh, crafting sessions to build the right gear for the upcoming season. This is a transition period that we're hosting this Eldercast in. And it's a great opportunity to, to start preparing for the next season. Yeah, and uh, like at Midland, we have the two fireplaces, one inside the tavern and one outside of it. And that's one of the things that allows us to do winter events. And it doesn't get too super cold usually. And we always get lucky on like the 40 degree days. At Esker, we burn through so much of the camp's wood, even though we pay for the use of the facility. We actually now <clears throat> are putting in our own platform with our wood, own wood stack, our own wood pile, and we need to come up with two cords of wood at least because we burn through probably half the camp's seven or eight cords that they use each year. I don't know, that's more like 10, but they want us to bring in some more wood, which we can do definitely. Um, that just tells you how much 
when you have seven camps all using wood, and especially if they're using it uh, not sparsely, which tends to coincide with if you start drinking, I don't know why, but you have more the hot the flames get hotter and bigger as you rog starts banging on the drum and we start drinking ale and it's like ah but that just really destroys your wood pile so we do have wood cleanup days at our place we do have where we'll skid woods out with the tractor and cut them up with the chainsaws and split them out uh we help with the, the camp to do that and um Folks like the Midland crew will bring a trailer of wood to their events sometimes. Um, so, I mean, having that fire, especially in the Northern Belt, when you know we come into a season where it might be 70 during the day, but it could be like 40 or 30 at night. So, um, it's definitely not out of the question. And you got to prepare for it. And like Carlos, okay, you got in Puerto Rico, you have a structure. I saw at some of your games, you got like a shelter area. And some of the places you were looking at have shelters. You could That's also right. bring, like, uh, you have those, um, I see them at the box stores. It's like a compressed water bottle that sprays out, like you can mist yourself, like the misting stations. Yep. Those help dramatically reduce body temperature. Well, for example, since we got our kind of weather back in the island, uh, we have no need basically no need to set off fire at all because the nights are even in at 80s um you need a fan though <laughs> but normally when we host a big event we could um start a fire so we can um cook basically that's the only reason that we have for it in the island but we honestly we don't use it much but you guys are used to it but like if I go down there, I'm gonna I'm gonna like try to carry an air conditioner on my back. Like this is this is how we do it in the north. <laughs> in the north. With well, the the... <sighs> the well you will have to try to yeah. you will have to try to garb that air conditioner. Because yeah. you won't be yeah. able to... I'm not, I'm gonna fail your 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 inspection. Yep. Um Scud posted um, that is there another topic of hold in the early LARP craft videos we did do a video like that called hold and pause some game promoters don't like to use the word hold because when you're trying to actually hold a line you use the word hold you know hold the line shields up front blah blah um, typically when you're saying it as a game admin thing a hold or a pause you would put your hands up to make it or you know if your admins use like an admin whistle that is the coolest it's totally not medieval so if you can pull out a whistle and you know just blow a soccer whistle or whatever um and just say hold hands in the air it's a totally different meaning than in game we do use hold sometimes um most of the times with the skirmishes being smaller you can just basically say pause or you know it's not as big the big battles though it's good to have like a out of game whistle or we also like at esker we we say uh if you hear a horn burst three times that's a distress call that's not in game do not ever blow a horn three times in a row as a distress sign because that if you hear that you should go running somebody's actually hurt or something's actually out of game happening so those are all communication tools that you can use to call that hold or pause. I, I can just tell it in Spanish. <laughs> well, we we tried one of our games. We tried to to role play on English, and we saw <laughs> it was one practice. So when when we know two languages, we we use the both of them to prevent that kind of situation. For example, uh, we can, we, my group who uses the word in English hold for the real hold out on the game. And we could use the Spanish word for it for the on in-game meaning. 
<laughs> Burners like game language equals native, commands equal English. I mean, that's easy to do if, you're, if, if your native language isn't English. Harder if your native language is English. But yeah, that, I mean, that, that works. And using different, different, um, different languages. We had a game up here where uh, quite a few people came in from uh, the, uh, one of the Native American tribes up, up, up in northern Wisconsin, and they were speaking their native tongue. And it was awesome because Native American um, uh, languages sound very tribal, because they are. And uh, it added a role play dynamic to the game we've never experienced before. It was really cool to see. And they, were, they, they, they didn't know if that was okay. I'm like, do it. That's awesome. You know? So, um, you know, use your negative languages and such. I mean, that's, especially when you're going to games that may not use it. Or come up with your own language, like Serena has her own language, I guess. Uh, there's others that also have it. So, people try to speak in Elvish. I've tried to learn it. I've downloaded the Gray's book. I've, like, I need people. It's hard to do by yourself. Um, Draconic, the Draken language um, is. Black speech. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we even have Draconic on our House of the Iron Ring. Uh, it's dr the Dragon language is actually how we translated our, our stuff um, to make it not so apparent as to what we're saying on our banner. What so, Dragon language? Which Dragon language? You have to language? figure that out. That's all in game, man. There's a story for it. You'll have to see us in game for it. Our banner actually means something. So those are. Uh, I use I use Boothark runes for you know orcish writing. So there's a lot uh, of the Viking runes. runes. Yep, and there's the Norse runes. There's a uh, I mean there's what seven or eight main seven or eight main rune languages. I mean there's a lot of different ruin symbols and language but the main one burner knows we talked about this uh a while back you know what's the main what's the main runic language Pre predominantly for, for the scandinavian nordic rules you have to see what time you're using it i mean you have you have the old one uh, the viking ish one and the modern one so there's I three mean, main. There are some regions in Sweden that used uh, the runic alphabet until the 19th century in some areas. It was like, and they had a modern, they had like A, B, C, D, uh, same as a normal alphabet. But before that, we had like 16 runes, and before that, we had like 21, I think. We got the real old one, like the Germanic one. So it, it all depends on. Uh, what time period you want to learn from. And that's what's really great about the internet is you have the conversions are usually available. So if somebody does post in a specific runic language, you can usually look that symbol or that language up and translate it. So that's, that's, that's really neat um, to be able to use that in game. Cause it, it does, it helps your characters. It helps your groups. It, it um, but, to also kind of give players some clues as to like, okay, what do these scribbles mean? To just even say, this actually means something, you can figure it out. Boom, you know, now you've basically opened the gate. Uh, we were actually just discussing that, me and my other team, about putting some scrolls, writing it out in runes, and then making like a Rosetta Stone scroll that has the runes and, you know, your common alphabet for somebody to find in order to translate that stuff. In the beginning player section of the scrolls, which will also be in the community, there is a how to change your language into like old English. It's not real good, but it kind of works. But that, there, that website, you can create your own translator for your language. So you could actually turn things into and out of your language if you have a direct correlation between whatever language you're starting with, the common language, and your fictitious language. You could actually come up with an entire thing and post it very quickly. You can put in a whole paragraph. It's just like translate. 
put in a whole paragraph, change it to the next language, and it'll do it for you if you set up that translator, right? That's a free service. Um, and again, it's posted in the scrolls, right in the beginner section, how to, the LARP guide on how to stay in character and, and writing right in character. So those are some tools you may be able to use. Yeah, because, and, and Berner's right, if you try to use an older English or an older runic, runish language or any other, the, the old language, the Latins, the, they don't have words in those languages if they're a dead language for modern words. So, um, you know, uh, if you like go with old English, that's different than Shakespearean like some of the some of the old old english you can't even understand it's so different than what modern english is that's just one example and like Berner was saying you know the three different runic languages i mean are very as they progress in in their history um they may not translate correctly but that translator program that allows you to make your own language you could usually use that as a game promoter as a faction as a group as a player to to do that so really cool stuff all right I think that I mean we went over uh, we're at an hour and 40 minutes um, maybe about an hour and 20 minutes we started a little late but I think that's probably a good topic to start to stop on we'll have another elder meeting at 7 p.m. tonight to um, address those who are currently working and you know trying to increase the communication, increase the player bases, make it easier for folks to understand what this game is about and how much fun it is. You know, that just takes going out there and doing it. And, and elder meetings, again, are held every, at the end of every month, last day of the month. And we, if this works good for us, we can use the, um, you know, the dual, we'll have two meetings in a day. A uh, morning and a, and, a, and a night to try and accommodate all parts of the world if we can. So let us know if you want to do that for October and beyond. And that'll be good. So thank you all for coming. Those of you who are here on time, um, you did get XP for the for the meeting. And October, yes, Rog brings or Drazul makes up a good point. That's a, that's Halloween probably won't do it on halloween that wouldn't work so well because that's all our favorite burners like what come on yeah in character in character halloween lark cast usually the october day is families running around trick-or-treating haunted houses blah, blah 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 but we could probably schedule for the end of the month that's not a problem we'll just change it we'll change the date for if it's on a holiday like that for some of us. Well, I'll, I'll actually be in kit that day. So, you know, that might actually be a good time for us. Okay. Well, we can for talk about day. it if you want to try it. That'd be, I'm, I'm not opposed to, to doing it. The Halloween Maybe not an special. elf meeting. Go ahead and schedule one for the end of the month, not on Halloween. But I think we could do just a, just a LARP cast in character. That might be fun. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of this. If you want to, if you have a question about this video, if you want to talk to one of the elders, <clears throat> their names are on the screen. Ask them questions in the scrolls. Look them up. Bernard's like, no, not me, not me. Um, but we're, we're here to assist you and we're here to help. So get out, go LARPing, have fun, and we'll see you in the games.